You mentioned, you know, Biden kind of being and his administration being so focused on Europe, like yeah. basically obsessed with it. I, I go back and forth between two reasons for that, whether it's like just nostalgia, you know, for, um, you know, our relationship with Europe of the past and for, um, you know, shared liberal democratic institutions or, or, or whatever, or is it um, kind of holdover, um, you know, Russophobia, basically, like just Russia is our biggest threat, um, which I think at this point we know is obviously not true. Um, uh, what What do you think about I that? I think in both cases, you actually just hit the nail on the head. Okay. I think you brought up a, a good point about this nostalgia. Um, you know, it's worth remembering that um, our Secretary of State, you know, grew up, uh, spent part of his childhood in Europe. His A lot of his family were ambassadors in Europe. Um, his acting deputy secretary of state, everybody's favorite State Department figure, Victoria Newland. <laughs> she's focused a lot of her energy on Europe. So if you've spent most of your career in these places and you have a lot of links and affinity for it from like a cultural level or, or as you said, you know, a nostalgia level. Yeah, you're going to want to prioritize that. And that's where I think the second part comes into play like you brought up the the russophobia i think we got to be honest it's like a lot of them still believe that russiagate was a real thing mm -hmm. they still believe that um putin is responsible for president orange man getting elected <laughs> and even though it was completely disproven even though it was a massive hoax undertaken by you know uh, the security state and sympathetic people in the media and and members of the of the blob um you know, they still believe that narrative and they view Putin as a more regressive uh, leader um, on social issues, on on other things as well, too. And and they view him as a larger threat to this global liberal order than, say, a a, a you know, a, a, a Xi in China. Um, and so that that's another reason why I think that they put so much effort into um, focusing on Europe, maintaining links there, constantly trying to reassure our European allies, and I'd say in some cases lying to them about where the American people really are on, on Ukraine and on our security relationship with, with Europe. And I also just say maybe add a, a third point is that it's actually less complex than the China issue. Um, China is, is such a large challenge in terms of of how interlinked they are with us economically, how powerful they've grown militarily um, over the past uh, several decades, um, their ability to um, manage in a lot of ways benefit from America's foreign policy failures over the last 20 years. And it's a lot easier to focus on Russia. And I, I think that's one reason why you see a lot of, of liberal hawks and even now, a lot of conservative, uh, you know, we could call neoconservatives that are going out of the way to downplay the threat of China because they want to focus more on Russia and Ukraine for the reasons we just discussed. But also, in a lot of ways, it's an easier issue. Mm -hmm. There's less issues that you have to tackle. You don't have to <clears throat> tackle things like decoupling and and intellectual property theft and espionage. So that 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 says a lot about the state of our foreign policy elite and who's managing our, our foreign policy. So one of the biggest issues I'm seeing uh, in terms of foreign policy for the conservative movement right now is that we don't really have a cohesive view on how conservatives should be thinking about this new crisis in in Israel. Um, I, th I think you have a lot of people in a, in a lot of different um, you know categories, people who want to give basically unlimited aid, people who want to give no aid, um, and basically everything in between. Um, I've been, it has now been reported that we, that we disdain the term new right. Um, but, but as you think about, um, the people kind of in our ilk, how do you think we should be thinking about, about, you know, aid to Israel and supporting them in this conflict? You know, just real quick, I, maybe I said this in another episode, but it just, it is kind of annoying how much time we have to spend spend defining certain labels or debating labels terms are so like stupid <laughs> um i a lot of people don't laugh at this but this is for why for like a while i just jokingly called myself a bathist like because it you know i've heard you say that yes yeah so um yeah so uh you know in regards to israel 
Israel has been one of those topics that we haven't been able to have an honest conversation about in, in, in about, you know, 20 years or so. And I think that that has hurt American foreign policy. I think it has also hurt Israel. Um, and, you know, a lot of people are maybe saying is like, oh, well, you're, you're are you saying you can't talk about like the Israel lobby or something like that? It actually cuts across the whole spectrum. You can't have a conversation about how atrocious Hamas is on the left because of this intersectional um, ideology. Uh, a lot of it, you know, rooted in in things like critical race theory. You mm -hmm. can't, you know, a lot of people on the left right now think that those 1400 Israelis that were brutally slaughtered, that were, you know, raped and murdered in horrific ways, even if some of the stories that that come out, you know, are are questionable. Let's just be honest. What Hamas did was absolutely savage. Mm -hmm. And they they the way that they fought was like savages. But you can't have that conversation on the left because of these racial justice ideologies, these identity politics that dominated them, because in their minds, the Israelis are of a, you know, privileged racial group. Mm -hmm. And, you know, likewise on on the right, um, you know, you can't have a conversation about how American foreign policy in the Middle East has actually hurt Israel. And if you say, well, you know, it's not really in our interest um, to start a major war with Iran, and actually it could hurt Israel, like you're smeared uh, as an anti-Semite by somebody like the Free Beacon yeah. or by like a John Portis at Commentary or, or whatnot. Mm -hmm. So I think there, there actually has been, as a result of this conflict, some some really good, honest discussions about it. I think uh, Sagar, who was on your show uh, a couple podcasts ago, I, I think he had some really good remarks. I know he's been trying to do out the show, and it has been good to have a more open, honest conversation. So with, with that, I think that it's important to look at it from a purely realist perspective you know, point of view. And mm -hmm. and others may disagree with my perspective or other realists, but I think that we need to remember that Israel has been a longtime partner of the United States in the Middle East. We, as I mentioned earlier, we have strong economic links, like our trade and in, in economic exchanges with Israel is like, you know, pre-Ukraine war is like 20, 20 times that of what Ukraine is. Um, they are an important part of our security architecture in the Middle East. There are some, you know, been some downsides and upsides to that over the years. But I so with that in mind, I think that it is absolutely in our interest to support Israel and do what we've been doing with them since 1973 and providing them with arms and logistics and aid. And we should continue to do that. Um, but there's there's two things that that I would caveat that with is one, it is absolutely not in our interest to get involved in another major war in the Middle East. Um, that would be disastrous for us. It'd be disastrous for Israel as well, too. People in northern Israel who are in range of, of Hezbollah rockets would pay a huge price. And that's why Netanyahu and other members of the Israeli government, I don't believe, want that. The second thing is, um, you know, you've heard people like Nikki Haley say that you know, when Israel was attacked, America was attacked. That That is not true. Mm -hmm. it, it, Israel was attacked. Yeah. This was not an attack on the United States. Yes, Americans were killed. There are American hostages. But this is not the same as an attack on the United States. And I point that out because when you start adopting that mentality, um, where an attack on every one of our, our partners or allies or, or everything bad that happens around the world, that's how you get into situations like we were in the early 2000s with Iraq and other places like that. And, and, and I'd also add to that, like Mike Pence and some other people said, we absolutely shouldn't put boots on the ground in mm -hmm. Israel. And I'd point out a lot of Israelis don't want that. Yeah. You had some Israelis like Yoram Hazoni. I was just going to plug that. Yeah, yeah that was he, a came great out, he came out and I believe his son did too, who's yeah. serving in the Israeli army, um, said that would be disastrous. Um, and just finally on this, is it's important to remember, we are, are limited in how we can support Israel right now. That is a hard reality that, that a lot of people in this town have not accepted yet. Because of, of how much we've given to Ukraine and how much we wore down our military after 20 years of war, um, 
we we are we cannot support Israel indefinitely in a long fight in Gaza or in a long fight against Lebanon. That's not that's not saying that, you know, we should demand Israel do this or that. I'm pointing out a reality of our power position right now. Like we drew down a lot of artillery and and probably some other munitions that we had pre-positioned in Israel and gave it to Ukraine. So as a result, we had to turn some of that around and give it back to Israel, take it back from Ukraine. And eventually, just like we have with Ukraine, where we've run out of stuff to give them, we may find ourselves in that same position with Israel. And it can't be overcome right away by dumping more money into the military industrial complex. It's going to take years to rebuild the capacity where we can adequately support a partner like Israel in a long fight and also support something like Ukraine and prepare for something, uh, a, a fight in China. Yeah. It's going to take us years to get to the point where we can adequately do that. Yeah, that's the thing that um, Elbridge Colby is always talking about yes. with those 105, 155 millimeter shells. Yes. Um, simply can't make enough of them to fight three wars so, at the same so time. So Bridge and I, <laughs> Bridge is one of those smart people who I just steal a lot of stuff from. But, <laughs> but in all honesty, Bridge and I have probably spent, of the times we've talked over the last year and a half, probably about... Half those conversations, one five five millimeter artillery shells have come up. Yeah, because it is actually one of the p- most important munitions for both Israel and Ukraine. You know, when the war began, I uh, I pointed this out that we are are um you know Israel is going to need a lot of artillery shells just like um uh um Ukraine does, and I was attacked for that. I had people, you know, like Mark Thiessen at the Washington Post attacking me. I had, you know, Max Boot retweeted it. Uh, some people at the Hudson Institute, uh, which is just, you know, uh, a neocon think tank here were attacking me. They said, Israel doesn't need artillery. You don't use artillery in urban warfare. And then, you know, here we are. <laughs> I, I started tweeting pictures at them along with a lot, uh, some other people of like American Marines firing artillery in the Battle of Fallujah. And guess what? Two weeks later. Um, the Biden administration div- diverted an artillery shipment uh, to Ukraine to Israel, and you know I still haven't gotten my apology yet, but I won't be waiting too yeah, long. Yeah, I'm sure their their tweets are you know so voluminous they just haven't had the time to go back and you know issue retractions or anything. Oh, and, like that. and I, I just I just have to point out something too. Israel was viciously attacked by a lot of these people uh, in the early part of the Ukraine war. Because they staked out a more neutral stance and they wanted to be set themselves up in some ways as a peacekeeper or a, a, a you know a peace negotiator between Russia and Ukraine. And you had a lot of people that were putting pressure on Israel to send their Iron Dome to Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Max Boot, um, Alexander Vindman and his lovely wife. Um, and, uh, you know, had Israel caved to that pressure and done that? a lot more of Israelis would have would have died. And I bring this up because Israel put the interests and safety of their citizens first. And yes, they suffered horrifically on October 7th. But had they were caved to pressure from a lot of primacists, both on the left and right here in the United States, a lot more Israelis would have died. So they deserve credit for actually doing what a nation should do. And that is prioritize the safety of their own citizens. Yeah.